Good morning, friends. It's great to be with you again. This is a very special Sunday today. This is Remembrance Sunday. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we do remember today your wonderful, wonderful love for us, your grace, which is beyond our understanding. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we look back, as we remember the life you've given us, we are filled with awe and wonder. And Lord, we're thankful. You've brought us through some rough times. You've helped us to get over hurdles that we thought were impossible to surpass. You've given us strength. You've given us courage. You've provided for us. We have so much to thank you for, Lord, and help us to remember. And as we remember, Lord, we pray that we will not forget the things that are most important. Help us not to forget the spiritual things. We could have all the material things in the world, and, and many do, but Lord, we know that that's not it. <clears throat> that doesn't cut it. <clears throat> The most important thing, Lord, is to know you. The most important thing is to know that we, we are free from the guilt that overwhelms us sometimes. We're free from the punishment that we richly deserve. So many things that no one else knows about, but you do. And Lord, you've helped us to overcome by your grace. You've given us freedom, and Lord, help us always to remember that. Help us as we remember the grace given to us. Help us, Lord, to forgive others. Help us, Lord, to be thankful and less critical. Lord, we do thank you this morning for our church family. We thank you for our own families, for our children, our grandchildren. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who's watching today, for everyone who's at, at church, for everyone who's not. And Lord, we pray that wherever they may be today, they'll just stop and remember and give thanks. And Lord, we pray that as, we t as they turn their attention to you, you will fill them with the awe and the wonder of your majesty. Help them to know, oh God, that you are real. And most of all, help them to know how precious they are in your sight, how much you love them. And now, Father, as your family, we pray the wonderful prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, our scripture reading this morning is taken from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May God bless his holy word this morning. 
In the sermon last week, I was talking about remembering the covenant, the greatest and most important of all the covenants of God with mankind, and that is the covenant of love. God promised to love us no matter what, no strings attached, forever. God's message to us is, you are loved. How wonderful. There's a Gaither song that they wrote in response to that truth. And I like it so much that uh, many years ago, I recorded it. It's called, I am loved. I'm not going to sing it, but here are the words. I said, if you knew, you wouldn't want me. My scars are hidden by the face I wear. He said, my child, my scars go deeper. It was love for you that put them there. I am loved. I am loved. I can risk loving you. For the one who knows me best loves me most. I am loved. You are loved. Won't you please take my hand? We are free to love each other. We are loved. And the second verse says, forgiven. I repeat it, I'm forgiven. And clean before my Lord, I freely stand. Forgiven, I can dare forgive my brother. Forgiven, I reach out to take your hand. And then the chorus says again, I am loved, I am loved. I can risk loving you. For the one who knows me best loves me most. I am loved. You are loved. Won't you please take my hand? We are free to love each other. We are loved. We are loved. The sermon title this morning uh, is Remember, in keeping with Remembrance Sunday, Remember the Cost of the Covenant. There are three main thoughts in our text. And each one can be summarized with one word. Those three words are reconciliation, forgiveness, and imputation. So let's think about those three words. The first two are familiar to you, no doubt, obviously. Perhaps the third one is not. So, so let's go. One New Year's Eve at London's Garrick Club, British dramatist Frederick Lonsdale was asked by Seymour Hicks to reconcile with a fellow member. The two had quarreled in the past and never restored their friendship. You must, Hicks said to Lonsdale. It is very unkind to be unfriendly at such a time. Go over now and wish him a happy new year. So Lonsdale crossed the room and spoke to his enemy. I wish you a happy new year, he said. But only one. <laughs> well, I guess that was sort of an attempt at reconciliation, but it seems to be missing that element of forgiveness, doesn't it? The truth is, you can't have one without the other. To be true reconciliation, there must be true forgiveness. It has well been said, Christ died our death for us, that we might live his life for him. That's profound. Let me read that again. Christ died our death for us, so that we might live his life for him. See, we have no excuse not to forgive, you and me. We have no excuse not to forgive. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and he wrote this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Remember, remember that God has forgiven you, my friend. 
God has forgiven me. Remember. And, uh, you know, if, if there are two words that should be uh, uppermost in everyone's mind these days, and uh, sadly, especially so for our, our American neighbors, those two words are reconciliation and forgiveness. Let's pray that they find it in that country. Reconciliation and forgiveness. Make a miracle that they would start loving each other. We need to pray. Well, at the beginning of uh, the sermon this morning, I said there were three key words. And the third one might not be as familiar as forgiveness and reconciliation. That third word is imputation. Do you know that word? <laughs> uh, imputation it actually is a word borrowed from the banking world. Uh, it simply means to put to one's account. When you deposit money in the bank, it, it's, credited, it's credited to your account. It's simple. It's a good thing. Uh, now, in spiritual terms, when Jesus died on the cross, this is so important. When Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins were imputed to him. Put on his account. Amazingly, Jesus was treated by a holy God as though he had actually committed all of our sins. And what was the result? All of those sins have been paid for, and God no longer holds them against us. You're allowed to say praise the Lord here, <laughs> because we have trusted Christ as our Savior. We're free. Amazing. That's why it's called Amazing Grace. But even more, God has not only forgiven us, but he has put to our account the very righteousness of Christ. The last verse of our text says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amazing words. I bought this word imputation. Uh, the founder of the Reformation, we've all heard of him, Martin Luther, wrote hundreds of years ago these words. Although out of pure grace, God does not impute our sins to us. He nonetheless did not want to do this until complete and ample satisfaction of his law and his righteousness had been made. Since this was impossible for us, God ordained for us in our place one who took upon himself all the punishment we deserve. He fulfilled the law for us. He averted the judgment of God from us and appeased God's righteous wrath. Grace, therefore, costs us nothing, but it costs another much to get it for us. Grace was purchased with an incalculable, infinite treasure, the Son of God himself. <laughs> no one could put that better, so I won't try. My friends, we need to remember the cost of the covenant. Remember, Jesus paid it all. We owe everything to him and to him alone. Without him, we would be lost. 
What was the cost to Jesus? He had to accept the responsibility and the degradation and the humiliation that went along with it. The acceptation of undeserved punishment is an astounding thing for someone to do. But Jesus, well, he was perfect, holy, sinless, totally innocent. But he assumed the guilt of me and of you, of all of us, all of our guilt, without exception, and without reservation. Imagine how degrading, how humiliating. We would hate to feel like that. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus willingly accepted it out of pure love for us. Out of pure love, in fact, he became the very effigy of sin. You would look at him hanging on that cross, and you would say, there is sin personified. It was I sin, not his. It's truly amazing. How could, how could we ever do what he did for us? Apostle Peter uh, says, to this you were called. What? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amazing. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Ah, uh, but the degradation, the humiliation, the suffering, the death, that was not the end. Following the pain and the humiliation was the exaltation. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian church, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. A great man of God, uh, was the Reverend Adrian Rogers. Uh, I admired him greatly. We, we lost him to cancer a few years ago, and, and what a loss that was to the Church of Christ everywhere. Uh, this is what he wrote, and, and I think marvelous, marvelous, marvelously so, about our, our Lord Jesus. He says, He came the first time to die. He is coming again to raise the dead. 
When he came the first time, they questioned whether he was king. The next time the world will know that he is king of kings and lord of lords. The first time he wore a crown of thorns. The next time he will be wearing a crown of glory. The first time he came in poverty. The next time he's coming in power. The first time he had an escort of angels. The next time he will come with ten thousands of his saints. The first time he came in meekness. He is coming again in majesty. Wonderful words. And so that leaves us with a question. What do we do about this Jesus? Do we just relegate him to history? Do we just remember him on his own remembrance days? <laughs> Christmas and Easter? You know, we have a Canadian joke about it, don't we? We all grew up with the Canadian National Exhibition, the CNE, uh, except this year, of course. <laughs> Uh, and we joke about CNE Christians, and we say uh, uh, a CNE Christian is, is someone who goes to church at Christmas and Easter. CNE. But you know, how often you go to church on Sundays isn't really important. I, don't tell anyone I said that, but it's it, it is really true. How often you go to church on on Sundays? isn't important. You can go every Sunday, but it, there might be something missing. The important thing is Jesus. Is he real in your life? That's the important thing. Do you talk to him every day? Do you pray every day? Do you communicate? Do you hear from him? Is he real? <laughs> That's the most important thing. Jesus does not want to be a remembrance. A memory. He wants to be a reality. Hey, friends, I, I, I know that uh, my preaching is not fancy, and I know it's certainly not profound. There are orators aplenty uh, who draw huge crowds every Sunday, and, and, and I could never do that. But that's okay. Um, you know, I always try to remind myself that. The real reason I, I simply preach the Bible is, first and foremost, I, I'm not smart enough to preach about anything else. That, that's the downside. But the upside is this. The Bible is a, is a bottomless well. In other words, I will never run out of material. So I guess I could say, I'm smart enough not to preach about anything else. And so this morning, in closing, I want to invite you on this Remembrance Sunday to remember that, as the text says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And remember that God has given you and me a job to do because he has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Uh, because of that, he has now given us the ministry of reconciliation. And we are now Christ's ambassadors. He's given us authority. And God is making his appeal through us. He has no other way. Listen, do you want to really, do you want to know real peace in the midst of all this chaos around us trust jesus and you'll have it and do you want your family and your friends to have that same peace tell them this as this text says i, I implore you on christ's behalf be reconciled to god god made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus accepted humiliation and death so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means this. 
you are being made good with the goodness of God. Ha. Now, I want you to think about that this week. <laughs> Amen. Our benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you, my friends. I'll see you next week, Lord willing. Bye for now.